In chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, we find David, King David, receive word about the death of his dear friend Jonathan and of King Saul, who he admired greatly. And we can observe how David deals with his grief. As we do, there are important lessons we can learn as biblical counselors. Because sooner or later, every one of us, and we will minister to people that are experiencing grief and sorrow of having lost someone that we love dearly. And it could be, it could be that we lose them in death. Well, it could be that we lose them as a close relationship drifts apart. That is devastating as well. But the loss of someone we love can be an extremely difficult, devastating, desponding experience. Many people have been totally destroyed because of their inability to deal with grief. So, lessons from David about grief. And I learned these lessons from Pastor Chuck Smith. He is now in heaven, but he's left behind many resources. This is one that I learned from him. So let's continue thinking about King David. So upon hearing the news, we read that David first responded emotionally. He demonstrated grief by rending his clothes, tearing his clothes. And it's strange to us, strange to me, but in the time during David, it was a common practice to, to rend a garment, or that's how you expressed extreme sorrow. David then fasted, he wept, and he mourned until evening. And it's important to understand, I think it's important that we release our sorrow. It's beneficial. It's okay. In in some circles, in some generations, we can be we can feel like we need to put on a brave face and repress a public expression of grief. And it's funny because you think some people even think it's spiritual to do it that way. But I think we need to shed tears. It's helpful. It's biblical. It's godly. Jesus wept. We weep. And we don't need to hold it back or hide it from anyone. Now, David's expression of grief wasn't limited to just tears. He spent time reflecting on the lives of both Jonathan and Saul. He wrote this eulogy, a lamentation for them. It begins, as David declares, the beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? This is found in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. It continues, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor the fields of offering. For there is a shield of the mighty is cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil, from the blood of the slain, from the fat, of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet, with other delights, who put on ointments of gold upon your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of a woman. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished. What a poem. What beautiful poetic words. David was the sweet psalmist of Israel, and he gave this lament, this expression 
to the deep grief he was feeling. And the people of Israel were able to sing these words in tribute to their fallen king and his son. So a third way that David dealt with his grief, quite interesting. And on the surface, it is difficult to understand that he was dealing with his grief even because in verse 18, it, it tells us that David gave orders to each father in Judah to teach his children how to use a bow, that bow and arrow. And it's significant that in a time of emotional distress, David instructs the people to get involved in this activity, a constructive activity. I think in the time of grief and sorrow, people can make the mistake of isolating themselves, becoming almost paralyzed in an in a introspection or emotionally indulged, uh, just going into this deep grief. I don't think that's healthy, and it can intensify and prolong grief. I, I love this lesson from, from David. He found that overcoming sorrow was to get active, to learn a new skill, and get out. And sometimes that's what we can do. We could, we can help people develop a hobby or travel or do something to uh, grow and not uh, simply isolate themselves. So David instructed his people to teach their children how to use a bow. And they didn't have, now, back then, you don't go to the local Big Five or the Sporting, go the sport, sporting Goods Store, Cabela's or something like that. Uh, they, they couldn't just go buy the archery set like we can today. You just have to go out and find a good sturdy branch, cut it down, carve it, turn it into a bow, and, and then, you know, fashion arrows and find feathers. And, you know, hey, this was what it was like making an archery set for the children. And an important benefit. I mean, David made this order, and the fathers, it developed a closeness between the father and their children as they worked together on this project. And so David had a, a purpose, was strengthening the family uh, and the bonds within the families in Israel. And archery, it took their minds off the loss of their leaders. It it served to bring parents and children closer together. And so this time of loss, how important it is to strengthen the bonds within our family. These are just lessons I see we read from the life of David when he was facing grief. And I think it's great that we can make effort to pursue activities to draw family together. We also see foresight on the part of David because he saw valuable lessons from the past and he looked forward to the future because in the battle, the Philistines, this was a new form of warfare they introduced, the bow and arrow. They, they were tightly organized. They had a con concerted effort and and they were used in battle, and the archeries were concentrating on a single target, and they got through, and you can't dodge them all, those, those arrows. And even if you have a shield, you just can't deflect them all. And it was this approach that was the mortal wounding of Saul. And so David saw this new long-distance form of warfare. Now, King Saul, powerful warrior, David's lament that the sword of Saul, it didn't return empty. And in one-on-one, hand-to-hand -on -one, -hand combat, there's no way these Philistines could stand a chance against Saul. So they adjusted their strategy. The archers brought Saul down from a distance, a safe dif distance, a lesson in tactics that David didn't forget. It wasn't lost on him. And so this would not be the last battle Israel would face. And it was a time in history, warfare, roving tribes. It was just a fact of life. People, people would, ha I mean, they would have to defend their village against anybody that would attack their family. 
So David could see there's an advantage. Let's develop archery skills for the future. So it, it brought families together. It helped develop a new skill. It also was an advantage for the future. And so how the lessons of the past make practical application for the future. He ordered fathers teach your children the use of the bow. Now, civil defense, the practice served as a, a memorial as well to Jonathan. Um, you know, we have memorials that are made of stone and plaques and marble monuments, wonderful things of a deceased person can be engraved on stone and it has meanings for friends and relatives. There's other ways to honor the memory of those who have passed on. And look, look at how Jonathan was a noted archer. And so it was so significant to look at the life of the person and, and what were the strengths and skills that made them special? Well, with Jonathan, he was an archer. And David speaks in this lament of the bow of Jonathan. And so fathers went out with their children, teaching them how to use the bow. They would remember Jonathan is a mighty man, outstanding warrior. What a fitting tribute. What a wise section of scripture. We learn so much from David, and we learn that the Bible is sufficient to help us deal. This isn't the only passage or the only instruction on grief, but it is a great evidence of the sufficiency of scripture to help yourself grow in grace and help others find help and hope and comfort in time of need. So a fitting tribute to Jonathan, teach the children to use the bow and honor. We can honor. It's beautiful to honor loved ones who have passed on by remembering and working with something concerning their strengths David, his intent, he desired to honor Jonathan's life. He ordered everyone to teach their children how to use the bow. And almost as if he was saying to Israel, this man has set a classic example. Let's follow it. It became a living memorial. And when the time comes and we lose those who have been so influential those who have touched our lives, it's good to get active. It's good to take something that they have been skilled for or, or adept in and determine that we're going to develop that ourselves and follow the good example that they left. In David's time, a bow, remember, was a weapon of warfare. And in that sense, there's an instruction for spiritual battles that we fight. And there's a spiritual weapon called prayer. And the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds of the enemy, 2 Corinthians 10.4. And so as the bow was able to lob arrows and strike the enemy from a distance without close hand-to-hand -hand combat, prayer can work the same way. Prayer is an excellent weapon we can bring a spiritual influence upon people from a distance. Whether it's for help and hope and comfort when somebody is lamenting and battling with grief, we can pray and God can work even from a distance if we cannot be there in person or they're, they're not willing to be reached at this moment it's okay we can pray and you know even for those that we love that don't know Jesus and we want them to know the joy of following him and the assurance of eternal life and we're desperate that they know the beautiful glorious love of God and the power of Jesus Christ in their lives and you know we can push and sometimes people resent that witness and they want us to get off their back or don't talk to me about this anymore. And 
and we don't want to argue. And so sometimes our best efforts have been a closed door. And so at times like that, God has equipped us with the long distance weapon of prayer. And we can, uh, we can not have to confront or do the face to face, but we can shoot arrows from a distance and they start getting, they start getting impacted. They get hit with the arrow of prayer and they don't know where it came from. They're maybe feeling conviction of sin and, and, uh, the spirit works in their heart through prayer behind, um, behind the scenes. It can bind the work of the enemy. It can bring help and hope and healing and strength and blessing. So prayer becomes a tremendous instrument in spiritual warfare because warfare and grief go hand in hand. Grief can be debilitating and uh, it's brutal and it, uh, it there's a depth of pain that cannot be explained by the one grieving and we'll never know exactly what it is that is going on in the heart but God knows and that's why prayer is so important and I'm talking real prayer where we're concentrating and praying and talking to God in intercession for those that we love it's a tremendous instrument in bringing others into the light and into the knowledge and into the understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So just as David had decided to make use of the bow and arrow a priority for the people of Israel, we can make use of the bow of prayer a priority in our lives. And it's effective in the spiritual battle in whatever area we're engaged, whether it's bringing comfort and hope and help or whether it's bringing conviction of sin that we want to just ask the Lord to do that by his Holy Spirit and there's nothing compares to prayer. We all know the pain of losing someone we love. But rather than allowing sorrow and grief to rule over our lives, we can turn even a time of tragedy into a growing experience when we yield and give it to God. You know, I have physical paperback books, hardcover books. I have a library. I like to keep my library. I don't want uh, the entire library to be electronic. I love my electronic books as well. And there is a Cruden's Concordance. If you, if I told you the name of Alexander Cruden, you'd probably have never heard of him. You might have heard of uh, Cruden's Concordance, kind of like Strong's Concordance. There's Cruden's Concordance, and maybe you've used it. Maybe you've seen it in the library. Maybe you have an electronic copy, and it's tremendous in helping find Scripture. Here's what a lot of people don't know: Alexander Cruden's Concordance was more or less born out of a very sad experience in the life of this man. He was deeply in love with a young girl who told him to kick rocks and broke his heart. And so rather than just closing in around himself, mourning and groaning, and he decided to just devote his his life to setting up this concordance so people could find Scripture more easily. So... Cruden's Concordance was actually born out of that heartbreak. And grief or loss can cause us to isolate ourselves almost in this prison of sadness. And these powerful emotions like grief can destroy our lives or they can be used by God as a stepping stone to reach out in a new direction in the will of God, into a new life, a new uh, a new step of faith, a, uh, maybe a, a, a talent, a uh, God can develop a gifting, a spiritual gifting, a new capacity he can give us. We can discover that God has a lot in store for us. The death of a loved one is not the end. It's a, a turn in the road for a whole new path 
that God might have for us. So what can this make possible in the, in the work of the Lord? And when we take the time of tragedy and, and, and use it as an opportunity to, to learn to use prayer like David used the bow, uh, there's no telling what wonderful things God will do. He'll turn things around for you. You wait. You watch. You'll see. As those whom we love, those who have meant so much to us are suddenly taken from us. The sorrow can either bring an end to life or it can be that stepping stone to greater things that God will want to do. It depends on how we respond. David just showed us, and there's all passages of Scripture that we could look at concerning grief, but David showed us a proper response. May God help us to do the same. May God help you to help others do the same. Maybe you're hurting today. Maybe you've been grieving for a long time. Maybe it's time to stop sitting still and learn to use a bow. In Jesus' name.